One of the things that I've discovered about Books to Huda um, as a composer, the, the processes, is a sense of wit. Now, I don't mean making jokes, but just the ability to, to turn a musical idea in a certain way, which if you were talking about the same idea, the same process in writing, we would probably say he was a very witty, uh, elegant uh, writer. Buxtehude is an extremely interesting composer, and the more you do his music, the more you realize that. Um, we thought, well, we should do more of this stuff. Uh, and Jakob Bloch Jespersen, who sings bass in the group, um, suggested that he look out and, uh, and find copies of music by um, not just Buxtehude, but from other composers who had some connection to Buxtehude. Um, either as friends or as colleagues or influence, this kind of thing. Buxnehude's works are well known already and um, so are uh, most of the cantatas by Wegmann and by Tunder. I think one of the great uh, discoveries has actually been over the past years uh, the music of Christian Geist, which I find uh, brilliant. He's also able to express himself in many different styles. Um, some pieces are uh, definitely uh, inspired by Italian style, other pieces in, uh, in North German or Central uh, uh, German tradition. So he uh, is a, he's able to express himself in, a, in in various ways, but in this uh, in this Christmas CD he's uh, represented with a uh, an, a small oratorio, an, an oratoric scene you could say um, of the, the the shepherds in the field. Uh, it's it's a brilliant uh, little piece. We put together a program of his music drawn as far as possible from uh, Scandinavian sources. Um, so that this wasn't just music by Buxtehude, it was music that had a direct um, historical connection with this part of the world. Because as you know, um, eventually he moved south to Germany and established himself there and that's where he became really famous and people make often the mistake of thinking that he's a German composer. He's not. He's a Danish composer. It's great to have a, a you know a single composer at the core of a particular project. But it's also rather interesting to be able to move sideways and up and down um, and look at other composers of that period, um, several of whom we have discovered for ourselves by doing their music, are extremely interesting in their own right. All of the composers in the program are represented in the Dubin collection. It's about uh, 2,300 uh, works collected there uh, from uh, Baltic countries, from Poland, from Germany, Italy, France, from, uh, from England. Uh, keyboard music, chamber music and vocal music. And the great uh, claim to fame is of course the, uh, the fact that most of the vocal music we know uh, by, by Buxtehude is uh, collected there as, a, as a, a unique source. And in fact, I think that this whole range of music that we've been um, working on and continue to work on is a process of discovery wherein the individual composers um, assume more distinct identities of their own. But at the same time, you get to really feel that there is indeed this, this regional voice. 
um, which they're all part of. There's one piece that's perhaps an exception to that, and it's on this new CD, Jesu Dulcis Memoria. Um, this is at perhaps my most favourite piece on that disc, in, at least in terms of a new discovery, because I hadn't come across it until we did this process, did this recording. Um, this piece doesn't use um, uh, an obvious melody in the voices or even in the instruments, um, but it does use uh, a, a ostinato bass. If one had to boil this down to one basic concept, it's the idea of a melody around which the composer weaves variations. Simple as that. I like to see a composer playing subtle games with the notes that he's put on the paper, whether it's a bass part or a, a melody from somewhere else. The use of an existing melody is an ancient tradition, as we know, in, in, certainly in Western art music. Um, if you go back in time to the Renaissance and to the Middle Ages, always, nearly always, there is a given element that, that it's borrowed from plain chants very often, most often in fact, and the idea of a cantus firmus, you know, the, the, the voice in the middle around which the newer voices are composed and constructed. The tune evokes memories and feelings in us, you know, like a, like a song that we knew as a child, maybe, and had forgotten, and then we hear it and suddenly, uh, like Proust's Madeleine, we, we, we taste it and we hear it and we, we're, we move back to a, a, a distant point in time. So I think that that's the, uh, the thing with most of these tunes. Um, but in the case of In Dulce Jubilo and Buxtehude's setting, what I like about that particular version is the fact that although the tune is obviously identifiable, he does something very different with it. It turns into melismas and, and vocalese almost, without losing the essential quality of the tune that is attractive. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, in particular, that's what I like about what Buxtehude has done with this very famous melody. When we make the, uh, the Baroque repertoire, um, I'm very careful to, to choose the singers who will do this, this music in a specific way. That is to say, with a deep understanding of Baroque style, but also a kind of personal, total commitment to performance, to bringing the music to life. When things really work, uh, in a, preferably in a concert, but it can also be in a recording, um, and when they really work, then it brings tears to my eyes. Um, and I can't really explain that. It's not being sentimental or, oh gosh, it's so beautiful, because it, often it's nothing to do with beautiful sound. It's the, it's the involvement of people making the sounds in a certain way where everyone is completely committed and enjoying themselves and also producing something that other people can enjoy. <laughs>